In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to Ernie Pagnot. He's trying hard to teach me to play golf. Hello, Ernie. Hi. You might think that nothing could be farther apart than my golf lessons and the subject of this film. But actually, I've learned from Ernie that the interpretation of golf scores is not so very different from the interpretation of test score. That's true, Ernie, isn't it? It sure is, Garvia. Certain basic principles of measurement are involved in both. Let's go out on the golf course and show you what we mean. Here we are on the 15th tee, where I'm getting in some driving practice. How's that, Ernie? Pretty good. About 20 yards, I guess. Good. Another about 50 yards. That's another real long one. Really hit that one. I guess that's about 170. Real good. Oh, about 140 yards. Good. About 120 yards, I'd say. Another about 150 yards. Gosh, those went all over the place. Ernie, how good a driver am I? I mean, how far would you say I can hit? Well, how far you drove doesn't necessarily tell how good a driver you are, Scarvia. Line, direction, can be far more important than distance. However, if you're interested in distance, let's see, seven out of 10 of your shots were between 110 and 150 yards. That seems to be about your usual performance. Or another way to look at it is to average those 10 drives. That would be about 130 yards. Thank you, Ernie. On the golf course, I had a chance to try that drive over and over again, and my shots varied considerably. In testing, we wonder how accurately one score earned on one day under a certain set of circumstances describes a student's real ability or achievement. Suppose, just suppose that you could test the same student many, many times with absolutely equivalent forms of the same test. Instead of this 38, you would see and expect to see a whole series of scores for him. Some would be higher, some would be lower, and some would be in between. As with my golf drives, we could look at the range in which, say, 70% of John's scores fall. That might be between 34 and 42 and represents the most typical measure of John's mathematical ability. In tests and measurements terms, we call this interval a confidence interval. And just as we average the golf drives to get a single best estimate of my driving ability, we could average the test scores John obtained to get a number which we call his true score. All of this is fine theoretically, you may say, but you can't give a student the same test over and over again. There would be practice effects and fatigue and insurmountable administration problems. I agree, but you can remember back to this example and make allowances for the fact that a student's obtained score and his theoretical true score may not be the same. Remember, John first came up with a 38, but his average score over a whole lot of testings happened to be 36. One way to provide safeguards against over-interpretation of single test scores is to take advantage of the standard errors of measurement presented by most test publishers for scores on their tests. These numbers can be used to estimate the range or band in which you can be fairly confident that students' true scores fall. Let's take an example. John earns a math score of 38. Mary earns one of 35. Can you say John is better than Mary on this test? Here are the facts you might work with. First, the only scores you have for John and Mary on this test are their 38 and 35. Second, the publisher lists four as the standard error of measurement for scores in this range. Third, you decide that you want to be right in your judgments about students two-thirds or about 70% of the time. Starting with John's 38 and Mary's 35, 
confidence intervals are established by adding 4 to and subtracting 4 from each score. Thus, John's and Mary's test standings can be represented by the score bands 34 to 42 and 31 to 39, respectively. Now back to the question, is John better than Mary on this test? When a more realistic picture of their scores is drawn, you can see that you wouldn't be at all justified in concluding there is any important difference between the standings of these two students. When I talk about imprecision in test scores, does it suggest to you that test scores are not a useful source of information? It shouldn't, any more than it suggests that a great many other measurements, important to our everyday lives, should be eliminated because they are inexact. However, the consequences of errors of measurement in test scores can be far greater than the consequences of errors of measurement in our household thermometers, wristwatches, and so on. The first step in test interpretation is certainly to recognize the fact that any individual's test score is not absolutely precise. The second step is to ascribe some meaning to a student's score by comparing it with the scores of other students with similar training, aspirations, or other relevant characteristics. Meaning usually comes from comparisons rather than from test scores themselves. To know, say, that I drove 170 yards on the first hole at Hopewell is not enough information on which to be awarded the three golf balls, which are the prize for the longest drive in this ladies' day event. If I win the golf balls, it'll be because my drive is longer than that of any of the other competitors. Similarly, to know that John got 80% of the problems on a math test right does not tell us whether or not to give him a special award for proficiency. The problems might have all been too easy for students at his grade level, or extraordinarily difficult. We say John has high quantitative skills because he scores higher than nine-tenths of a group of students in his grade in the country on the math test. Such meaning is usually given to test scores by consulting tables like this, with scores running down the left-hand side and percentile ranks running down the right-hand side. You know, of course, that a percentile rank describes the percentage of students in the group who scored lower than the indicated score. Thus, for the score 48, we say that 95% of students in the group earn scores less than 48. Or, expressed another way, only about 5% earn scores higher than 48. One of our main testing troubles arose because someone, somewhere, made the unfortunate mistake of labeling such score percentile distributions norms. The first meaning of norm in the dictionary is standard, and test norms are certainly not standards. No distribution of test scores ever drawn will tell you what score students ought to make. All a distribution of test scores can tell you is how some particular group of students did on a test. Your major job in assigning a percentile rank to a test score is to select the appropriate group with which to compare a specific student. Let's take the case of Harry. Harry is a ninth grader. He took a standardized reading comprehension test. He earned a score of 225. A clerk, asked to look up his percentile rank on a norms table, recorded the rank as 99. Harry's mother said, Very good, Harry. But Harry's teacher thought, Heavens, there's something funny here. The brightest kid in my class, who is definitely not Harry, had a percentile rank of only 90. Sure enough, she looked it up and found that Harry's percentile rank of 99 was in terms of comparison with a national 5th grade group. Harry, compared with a national ninth grade group, showed a percentile rank of only 70. 
This whole story turned on a clerk's error. But it should serve to point out that an interpretation can be sensible only if the norms group on which it is based is appropriate. This is not to suggest that there is not frequently more than one norms group which would be appropriate in interpreting a given student's score. For example, let's consider two students in two different schools tested in the spring of the high school senior year. Their counselors might want to see how their performances relate to each of three different groups, high school seniors in their own schools. These would be local norms. High school seniors in the national sample used in the publisher's norms. High school seniors later accepted by the state university. These norms might have been worked out in a cooperative effort of high schools and the state university admissions office. Let's see how Sally's percentile rank standing might vary when her score is compared with each of these reference groups. Sally's high school is an outstanding school with a large percentage of students going on to college. Sally has earned above average marks in this school. In terms of senior norms in her own school, Sally's percentile standing is 70. In terms of the publisher's national senior norms, which include many students from schools with lower academic standards than Sally's, Sally's percentile rank is 90. In terms of the students accepted by the state university, Sally's standing is 80. You can infer from this that the state university accepts many students from high schools where student and instructional levels are lower than in Sally's school. Fred, on the other hand, comes from a school in a poor socioeconomic section where the number of parents who have finished high school and the number of students who are encouraged to go on to college are very small. In terms of senior norms in this school, Fred's percentile standing is fairly high, 70. In terms of the publisher's national norms, which include students from schools with higher academic standards than Fred's, Fred's percentile standing is only 50. In terms of the students accepted by the state university, Fred's standing is down to 40. Remember, test interpretations depend on the specific group with which a given student's performance is compared. Obviously, comparisons with different groups will yield different interpretations. Remember, too, that a student's test standing cannot be characterized by a single point because scores are not that accurate. Test standing should be listed or plotted as bands. Let's see how specific provision for these two factors is made in the student report form for the cooperative English test. First, you'll note that the norms group is clearly identified. Ernest, who is a 10th grader, is being compared with the publisher's national sample of 10th graders tested in the fall. Second, Ernest's percentile standing on each of the tests is expressed realistically, not as a point, but as a band, which takes into account the errors of measurement implicit in all test scores. A bonus of the percentile band approach is the convenience of making comparisons between two test standings. The rules are simple. If the two bands overlap, it is impossible to say with any certainty that one standing is higher than the other standing. If the two bands don't overlap, you can say with considerable certainty that standing represented by the band to the right is higher than standing represented by the band to the left. Look at Ernest's total reading comprehension and English expression band. They don't overlap and the interpreter is on firm ground in concluding that reading standing is, in fact, higher than expression standing. In summary, all that the golf pictures and the cases of John, Harry, and the other students have set out to do 
is to make you carry around two big suspicions in your test interpretation work. First, beware of anyone who tries to pin down anything as complicated as the mental processes of a human being under one test score number. Second, beware of any unexplained percentiles you come across. A percentile is meaningful only if you know what students were included in the norms group. There are times when suspicion can be a virtue. 